My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. Welcome to Ancient World Studies. Thank you for your choice, Pythias, Beyond the Ocean. This lecture series examines the Greek discovery of Northern Europe in the 4th century BC. It also considers ancient beliefs surrounding a semi-mythical landmass in the far north named Thule. If you wish to credit this lecture in academic bibliographies, Enter the text, McLaughlin, Pythias, and Ancient Thule, YouTube, August 2019. It is relevant to this study that in 2014, astronomers using the Hubble telescope identified a previously unknown planetary body on the edge of our solar system. In 2019, the New Horizons NASA probe conducted a flyby to photograph this remote object from the depths of space. Astronomers named the object Ultima Thule because they wanted to evoke the idea of a far-off, ice-bound destination at the outer limits of human reach. The name Thule is often pronounced Thule, but the term has its origins in the ancient classical past. Early Greek and Roman writers often refer to a remote land to the north of Britain known as Ultima Thule, or Furthest Thule. They describe this place as an isolated landmass at the northern edge of the known world, a location that was subject to extreme cold. In Latin poetry, the island became semi-legendary, representing the geographical limits of mankind and the furthest ambitions of human civilization. The question is, where was ancient Thule? Was it a myth, an ideal, or a real location? There are several candidates for the location of Ultima Thule. Looking at modern maps, some scholars have reasoned that ancient descriptions of Thule, an island to the far north of Britain, must describe Iceland. Iceland, a large ice-bound volcanic landmass located in the Atlantic Ocean, is about 500 miles to the northwest of Britain. This island is positioned in the extreme north of Europe, on the edge of the Arctic Circle. But there is another candidate for ancient Thule, and that is the Shetland Isles, the most northerly island cluster in Britain. They are located about a hundred miles from the Scottish mainland. A third possibility is that ancient authorities confused their sailing directions and Thule is actually part of Scandinavia, perhaps the outer coasts of Norway. The first classical author to write about Thule was a Greek explorer named Pythias who lived in the 4th century BC during the time of the famous Macedonian king Alexander the Great. During this era, Greek civilization had just conquered the Persian Empire, but still knew little about the people of Northern Europe. In North Africa, the powerful maritime kingdom of Carthage dominated the Straits of Gibraltar and confined Greek shipping to the Mediterranean basin. These Carthaginians were Phoenician settlers from the Near East who colonised for mercantile reasons. They prevented exploratory Greek voyages into the Atlantic and blocked access to sailing routes that led around the west coast of Europe. These sailing routes supplied the Carthaginians with a range of valuable commodities, including gold and valuable amber. Most importantly, Atlantic Europe provided the Carthaginians with tin, which was an essential component in manufacturing bronze. Bronze is a resilient alloy, formed from about 90% copper and 10% tin. When newly cast and polished, it presented a radiant golden colour, but when tarnished by time and wear, it darkened and often developed a blue-green patina. The Greeks required bronze for their armour, rust-proof maritime equipment, and for their magnificent statues of gods and heroes. During this era, Greek citizen soldiers 
wore hoplite armor, including a bronze helmet, bronze cuirass, large circular shield, and bronze leg greaves. The distinctive hoplite shield was made from a concave wooden core with a bronze reinforcing rim to deflect oblique blows. Often the surface of the shield had a bronze sheathing, possibly to dissipate heavy blows that could splinter the wood. Often the soldier had a bronze emblem fitted to his shield as a marker of his city-state, profession, attributes, or family allegiance. Sometimes swords or spear points were made from polished bronze, but in later periods iron was a more effective choice because of its superior cutting edge. This bronze armour gave Greek citizen soldiers a distinctive appearance compared to other warrior cultures. Herodotus describes how a deposed Egyptian warlord was advised by an oracle that he would have vengeance when he saw men of bronze coming from the sea. Soon after, he heard reports that a squadron of Greek ships had been forced to make landfall in Egypt, and the crew had disembarked in their full bronze armour. These were the bronze men described by the oracle. The rams on the prows of oared powered Greek war galleys were also made from bronze. The rams were heavy bronze castings, including horizontal blades. This beak-like device, fitted to a projecting timber near the waterline, could weigh more than a ton. When the galley was rowed at speed, the bronze ram could disable an enemy vessel by fracturing its hull. If the attacking ship aimed to pass parallel, the ram could also shear off banks of oars prior to boarding actions involving brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Copper to manufacture military equipment was a plentiful resource in the Mediterranean and the Near East. But tin was rare, and the greatest concentrations of this ore were to be found in Spain and northwest Europe, in lands that the Greeks could not reach. The tin trade was managed by the Carthaginians, who shipped this resource to their kinsmen on the Phoenician city ports of Syria. Greek traders had to use silver coins and pay inflated prices to acquire the metal. Ancient amber came from the Baltic coast of northern Europe and was trafficked south by Germanic and Celtic tribes with trading links to the western Mediterranean. Amber is a fossilised tree resin, but the Greeks did not understand its age, origin or composition. It was sometimes assumed to be the congealed matter formed by the setting sun as it passed through distant northern seas. It therefore became known as electron, from the Greek term for sun, elector, meaning the shining one. Decorative amber had the same value as gemstones, and was worn by women in necklaces and other jewellery. It was a relatively easy material to carve into desired shapes, and polished to create a gleaming surface. Pliny the Elder describes translucent ambers with the fiery glare of flames, but the most favoured pieces had the mellow tint of honey or the reflective glow of pale wines. Amber also had practical uses due to its natural electrostatic properties. The Greeks noticed that when rubbed against cloth, amber would attract light particles such as dried seed husks or thin threads. Ancient peoples therefore made the whorls of their spindles from amber. Amber spindles generated an electrostatic charge to better draw together, align and twist the strands of the fibrous material being spun into yarn. This spinning process was a major part of textile production and was used to create wool, flax, hemp, cotton fabrics and also rope. Fabric production, practiced by women in the household, was an essential part of the ancient economy. Pliny the Elder confirms that 
In Syria, the women make the whirls of their spindles from amber. They give it the name of harpax, to drag or snatch, because it attracts fibers towards it, including chaff and the light fringe of fabrics. The electrostatic properties of amber were investigated by Renaissance scholars who applied the name electron to the strange electric charge produced by the material. The observations and experiments of later inquirers led to the discovery and development of modern electricity. This is the historical context where Pythias gained great renown by being the first Greek sailor to evade the Carthaginian blockade and explore northern Europe. He voyaged north, beyond Gaul, past Ireland to circumnavigate Britain. There he learned about the mysterious island of Thule at the northern limits of Europe. He then continued his explorations around the Germanic coast towards Jutland and the Baltic. On Pythias's return to Greece, the report he prepared for his countrymen greatly expanded ancient geographical knowledge. This new appreciation of what lay beyond the Gibraltar Straits, the Pillars of Hercules, permanently altered how the Greeks perceived the form and shape of the earth. Pythias brought back information about unexplored northern territories, rich in valuable trading commodities. He returned with remarkable accounts of the northern European peoples and the cultures to be encountered at the edge of the continent. Unfortunately, the original report compiled by Pythias has not survived into modern times. What has survived are ancient documents where his work was quoted and discussed by many later Greek and Roman scholars who were interested in the geographical limits of the known world. Consequently, an outline of the voyage can be reconstructed. This provides the scholar with the earliest eyewitness descriptions of the North Europeans as they were at the beginning of the historical era. Pythias was from the commercial city of Massalia, which was founded by Greek colonists in around 600 BC. The ruins of ancient Massalia exist beneath the modern metropolitan port of Marseille on the Mediterranean coast of southern France. Pythias was able to undertake his extraordinary voyage due to the unique advantages provided by the position of his home city and the alignment of certain historical events in the era in which he sailed. In this period, Greek civilization existed within a network of semi-independent city-states in Greece and western Anatolia. These city-states shared a common ancestry and culture. From an early era, many of these political communities used their maritime trading links to establish coastal urban colonies at distant sites. These sites were selected for their valuable resources, trading connections or other economic potential. Ancient Massalia was one of these sites, founded during an era when the Greeks sent fleets west to colonize large parts of Sicily and the Italian peninsula. Often these satellite settlements were established by hundreds of colonists, allocated extensive funds and resources from the founding city-state. As they gained greater independence over time, these colonies often developed into large prosperous cities, controlling significant hinterlands and able to disseminate Greek culture by establishing their own economic settlements in further overseas territories. For example, the Greek city of Syracuse on the island of Sicily became one of the leading political entities in the central Mediterranean. The economic strength and strategic location of Syracuse made the city a power that other Greek colonies looked to for leadership and assistance. This colonization process occurred over several generations and was so successful that the Latin inhabitants of Italy referred to the Greek territories in the Western Mediterranean as Magna Graecia, Greater Greece. 
The scale of the settlements is indicated by events in 481 BC, when the Persian king Xerxes prepared his armies to conquer mainland Greece by defeating the dominant city-states of Sparta and Athens. In this era, the Iranian-based Persian Empire stretched east from Anatolia, Syria and Egypt, across Iraq and Iran to the frontiers of India. The Greeks had angered the Persian king by supporting revolts occurring amongst Greek cities in coastal Anatolia, subject to his rule. Herodotus reports that the city-states of mainland Greece hoped to deploy a fleet of 378 war galleys to defend their homelands. But they also sought help from their western kinsmen, and the Greek city of Syracuse offered to marshal a force of 200 galleys to assist them. However, arguments over the overall leadership of the expedition ultimately prevented the Western Greeks from intervening in the war. Nevertheless, this war ended in the defeat of Xerxes. In 480 BC, the Persian fleet was defeated by an Athenian-led coalition at the Sea Battle of Salamis. The outnumbered fleet of Greek trireme war galleys rammed the disordered Persian battle line. Their hull-mounted bronze rams disabled the enemy vessels, while the onboard soldiers launched audacious boarding actions. Plutarch describes the epoch of the battle, when a Greek vessel rammed the heavily equipped Persian flagship, and, as the two ships struck each other bow on, they crashed together and hung fast by their bronze beaks. The Persian admiral was speared trying to board the trireme, and his lifeless body hurled into the sea. The decisive land battle of Plataea occurred the following year, when, led by the Spartans, the bronze-armoured infantry of the allied city-states defeated the Persians on the Greek mainland. Massalia, the home city of Pythias, was on the outer fringe of the Greek colonisation zone on the northern shores of the western Mediterranean. By 400 BC, Massalia had developed into a large and powerful trading city with a substantial hinterland planted with rich vineyards. Modern estimates, based on the size of the ancient city, suggest that Massalia had a population of perhaps 50,000. In this era, the population of Gaul was Celtic, but the Massalians remained on good terms with the main tribal powers in the region. They supplied these Celtic communities with wine and Greek craft goods that were traded inland through the main river systems of ancient France. The Roman writer Strabo describes the geography of ancient Gaul. He reports, The whole of this country is watered by rivers. The districts through which they flow are mostly plains and hilly lands with navigable watercourses. These watercourses are well positioned by nature so that transportation can be made between seas using the rivers. For the cargoes are transported only a short distance by land, with an easy transit through the plains. Most of the way they are carried on the rivers, on some into the interior, on others to the sea. The Rhone, which flowed into the Mediterranean near Massalia, was an important trade route for this early commerce. Strabo explains that interior trade brought Atlantic goods to the Rhone, and the river watered a coastal territory abundant in Mediterranean crops. He writes, The Rhodanus River, the Rhone, is an advantageous route for it is a stream with many tributaries that leads to our sea, the Mediterranean, which is superior to the outer sea, the Atlantic. This river also traverses a territory which is the most favoured part of this region, for the whole of the province produces the same fruits as Italy, with olive-planted and fig-bearing lands, and also vines. Strabo 
also describes the goods coming from the interior of Gaul. He reports, The country of Gaul produces large quantities of grain, millet, nuts, and all types of livestock, and none of the country is untilled, except parts where tilling is prevented by marshes and woods. Yet these parts are also densely inhabited, due to the size of the population. Other ancient sources suggest the potential scale of Celtic trade and production. Appian estimated that central and northern Gaul had a population of about 4 million in the pre-Roman period. The wealth of goods and material produced from the Celtic interior of Gaul helped Massalia develop into a leading commercial power in the Greek Mediterranean. It also led the Massalians to look north in the pursuit of new opportunities at the western edge of Atlantic Europe. It was against this background that Pythias set out to establish direct trade links with northern Europe. For what he found as he ventured beyond the Pillars of Hercules, subscribe to this channel for the next video lecture. I will be placing the text of these lectures on the research website academia.com. You can become affiliated with this lecture series by purchasing merchandise. Follow the link below. Thank you.